welcome to MCNA Prime Time. Assalamu alaikum, boys and girls. Welcome to our ninth Sira session. We hope everyone is enjoying the great weather. Alhamdulillah for the opportunity to appreciate this beautiful weather. While the AC and cold water brings coolness to our bodies, the stories of our Prophet ﷺ brings coolness to our souls. As we need food for our body survival, we need the Quranic and prophetic traditions for our soul survival. Today is our last class, so we have a very fun program set up for you today. First, we will learn about the last part of the Prophet Wasallam's life. And in between, we will have a few fun games, a fun nasheed that you can sing along to, and we have a really fun skit prepared by our lovely teachers. And for the cherry on top, I have a very exciting announcement for you, so stay tuned! Like always, we will begin with our du'as. The first du'a, and I hope you're all familiar with this by now, is This means, O oh my Lord, open my chest for me, and make my task easy for me, and untie the knot from my tongue so that they understand my speech. Do you want to try saying the du'a this time? You can repeat after me. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli The next dua is Allahumma faqihna fi al-deen which means O oh Allah Endow upon us with the understanding of the religion. Endow here means to give. Do you want to try saying the du'a this time? You can repeat it after me, word by word. Allahumma faqihna fiddin. Great job! Before we start today's lesson, let's review last class. As we have learned about the events that led to the Battle of Badr, which was the first decisive battle between the Muslims and the Quraysh, we have seen its impact on the Arabian Peninsula. The Muslims had gained miraculous or unbelievable victory, as there were just 313 of them against 1,000 Qurayshi men. That was considered a huge blow to the polytheists or idol worshippers' religious and economic status. It had a serious impact on the Jews as well, since they viewed each Islamic victory damaging to their religious and political status. They needed the hypocrites as their helpers, who were another group of so-called Muslims who were hesitant to submit themselves to Islam completely for their material gains. The fourth group was a group of desert Bedouins who were scared that an Islamic state would put an end to their crooked lifestyle of robbing and looting people in the outskirts of Medina. So there were four groups who were against Muslims and planned to hurt them and end their struggle for a just Muslim state. Thus, the Muslims were forced to be alert for any attacks or hateful activities to protect themselves. They also had to take some precautionary or careful steps to ensure their security. So let's talk about the military activities that took place after the Badr expedition. The first one was the Al-Qudr invasion. This invasion took place seven days after the Battle of Badr in Shawwal in the year 2 AH. When Prophet Muhammad وسلم, learned from the spies that Banu Salim was planning on an attack, he took action and made a surprise attack on them at a watering place called Al-Qudr. Although they had fled before the attack, the Muslims were able to get the booties or loot, which was 500 camels. The second was an attempt on the life of the Prophet after the humiliating defeat at the Battle of Badr, the Meccans were fuming with hate and anger and wanted to take revenge by taking Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life. 
two polytheists, Umayyad ibn Wahhab and Safwan ibn Umayyah, plotted to kill the Prophet Under the fake intention of meeting his captive son, Umayyad went to the Prophet's masjid in Medina with a poisoned sword. He was stopped by Umar ibn Khattab at the masjid's door, but was permitted to see the Prophet ﷺ upon his arrival. When asked about the sword, Umayyad tried to trick them, but the Prophet ﷺ, who was informed about his hidden agenda, exposed his plan. Umayyad was astonished and extremely surprised that none other than Safwan and him knew about their scheme and was so impressed by the whole incident that he accepted Islam right there. The Prophet ﷺ was pleased with his decision and released his son. To Safwan's disappointment, Umayyad did not just embrace Islam but also preached it and was successful in converting many Meccans into Muslims. The next was the invasion of Bani Qaynuqa. Although Muslims were holding fast to the conditions of the peace treaty signed with the Jews, the other party violated or broke it terribly. They not only tried to renew the hate between the two tribes of Aus and Khazraj, who were now bonded by the Brotherhood ties, but showed their enmity to the Muslims by ruining them in their financial dealing. The worst among the Jews were the tribe of Banu Qaynuqa, who had broken the treaty by hurting and humiliating the Muslims publicly, ridiculing and terrifying the Muslim women to the extent where the Messenger وسلم, had to warn them against it. But they were so arrogant and disrespectful that they boasted about their war skills and armed forces. In this regard, the following ayat were revealed in the Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل للذين كفروا ستغلبون وتحشرون إلى جهنم وَبِئْسَ الْمِهَادِ قَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ آيَةٌ فِي فِئَتَيْنِ الْتَقَتَى فِئَةٌ تُقَاتِلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَأُخْرَى كَافِرَةٌ يَرَوْنَهُمْ وأخرى كافرة يرونهم مثليهم رأي العين والله يؤيد بنصره من يشاء إن في ذلك لعبرة لأولي الأبصار. Translation Say to those who disbelieve, You will be overcome and gathered together to hell, and hopeless is the resting place. Already there has been for you a sign in the two armies which met one fighting in the cause of Allah and another of disbelievers. They saw them to be twice their own number by their eyesight. But Allah supports with his victory whom he wills. Indeed, and that is a lesson for those of vision. Rasulullah had suppressed his anger and asked the Muslims to be patient when the Jews provoked them for war until the rebellion and misbehavior resulted in the death of a man by the Jews. This man could not tolerate the humiliation of a Muslim woman and had killed the Jewish abuser. The war started on a Saturday, on the 15th of Shawwal 2 AH, with the Prophet ﷺ marching with his soldiers and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib carrying the Muslim flag. They encircled the Jews' fort for 15 days, which led to the surrender as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had cast fear into their hearts. 
upon the request of the Khazraj leader and a fake Muslim, Abdullah bin Ubay, their lives were spared and were banished to Azru in Syria, where they perished after some time. The next was the Asawiq invasion. On one hand, the hypocrites and the Jews continued plotting, and on the other hand, the Qurayshi leader, Abu Sufyan, was desperate for revenge for Badr. He conspired with the Jews and raided al rudaid a city on the outskirts of Medina, along with his 200 men at night, as he did not have the courage to do so in daylight. When the Prophet ﷺ heard about the destruction of the palm trees and the killing of two Muslim men, he ﷺ chased them. However, the Quraysh had already escaped, leaving behind Sawiq, a barley porridge, to lessen their burden. Hence, this invasion is called a Sawiq. This took place in Dhul Hijjah to AH, two months after the Battle of Badr. The next is the Dhi Amr invasion. This invasion took place on the 3rd of Muharram. When the Messenger Wasallam's intelligence received the news that Banu Tha'laba and Banu Muharib were gathering troops to raid the outskirts of Medina, he Wasallam set out to handle the situation with 450 horsemen and footmen, but after their enemies disappeared, the Muslims had camped at a watering place called the Amr for the whole month of Safar 3 AH. The aim was to impress the desert Bedouins in the area and cast fear and awe into the hearts of their enemies. After this was the invasion of Buhran. In Rabir al-Thani, the year 3 AH, the Messenger وسلم, led a campaign of 300 warriors to Buhran in the area of al furur and in spite of staying there for about a month, no fighting took place. Last was the campaign of Zayd ibn Haritha. This was the most successful campaign before the Battle of Uhud, and it took place in Jumada Thani, year 3 AH. It was summertime when the Qurayshi caravans left for Syria with their trade goods, but were scared that they would be attacked by the Muslims, so they changed the usual trade route. When the Prophet ﷺ learned about it, he gathered 100 horsemen under the leadership of Zayd ibn Haritha and sent them to capture the caravan led by Safwan ibn Umayyah. Safwan and his guards fled, and the Muslims could successfully capture the booty, or loot. They had to show their courage and stand up to the injustice and the torture of the polytheists in order to lay down the foundation for a peaceful Muslim state. Instead of making peace with the Muslims, the Quraysh chose to crush the military forces of Medina. These forces, on all levels, formed the basis to the Battle of Uhud. Now let's talk about the Battle of Uhud. The Kuffar of Mecca were furious after their defeat at the Battle of Badr. They began planning another attack. Almost one year after Badr, an army of nearly 3,000 Kuffar came to attack Medina. The Muslim army numbered only 1,000. There were also 300 Munafiqun in the Muslim's army. The Munafiqun left the army before the battle started and tried to get other Muslims to do the same. They hoped that their leaving would make the Muslims lose heart. They also expected that the large size of the enemy force would frighten the Muslims into giving up. But the Muslims' faith and commitment were firm. We will never leave our Prophet, they said. If we live, we will live as Muslims, and if we have to die, we want to die fighting for the truth. The two armies soon faced each other near a mountain called Uhud. This mountain was about three miles north of Medina. There were 3,000 Kuffar against 700 Muslims. Before the battle started, Rasulullah wasallam ordered some archers to guard a hill so that the back of the Muslim army would be protected. They were told not to leave the hill no matter what. The battle started quickly. At first, the Kuffar were losing the battle and many of them started to run away. The Muslims were overjoyed, thinking that they had won the day. 
They ran forward to chase the kuffar and gather up the weapons and supplies left behind. When the archers guarding the post saw the enemy running away, most of them left their post. They wanted to take their share of the war loots. They did not think that they were disobeying the Prophet ﷺ. They thought that the order to stay at the post was during the battle, and now that they have won the battle, they could leave their post. This caused confusion amongst them, and only a few archers remained to guard the post by Rasulullah ﷺ's order. Seeing that the hill was unguarded, the horsemen of the kuffar rode around the unprotected hill and attacked the Muslims from behind. A fierce fight followed. Many of the believers were killed, and many others were wounded. Rasulullah ﷺ himself got wounded, and the kuffar began to shout that they had murdered him. When the Muslims heard this, they were shocked and started losing their courage. Even though Rasulullah was wounded, he was safe. The Sahaba who were near to him protected him at every side. They helped him go up the mountain to his tent where it was safe. When the Muslims learned that Rasulullah was alive and well, they were relieved. Both sides were exhausted by the fighting. Many dead lay on both sides. Although they did not completely defeat the Muslims, the Kuffar believed they had gotten revenge for their defeat at the Battle of Badr. The Muslims were saddened because many of their brothers had been killed in the battle. Rasulullah's own uncle, Hamza, radiallahu anhu, was martyred and his body mutilated. The Muslims also remembered that some had followed the Munafiqeen and stayed home, and still others disobeyed Rasulullah's order to guard the hill. They understood that the loss of so many lives was the result of not obeying Rasulullah's order. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent wahi concerning the battle of Uhud. He told the Muslims to be patient and put their trust in him. Their faith will be tested in many ways, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to give the believers victory if they remain faithful. After the battle of Uhud, the kuffar and their friends became very bold. Some of these people even went so far as to deceive the Muslims. They would invite the Muslims to come and teach them Islam, but when they came, they would be slain. It was a very difficult time for the believers, but they remained patient obeyed their Prophet وسلم, and prayed to Allah for help. Before we move on to the next part of our Sira lesson, let's play a very quick game. Can you guess the animal from its sound? Now let's talk about events that occurred after the Battle of Uhud. The Battle of the Trench is also known as Ghazwat al-Khandaq. It was a 30 days long fight between Muslims of Medina and the Jewish tribes and the Quraysh of Mecca. The defenders of Medina were Muslims led by Prophet Muhammad He ordered a trench to be dug on the suggestions of Salman al-Farsi. That trench gave Muslims the benefit of defeating enemy armies and suffering fewer casualties. The commanders of Muslims in this battle were Muhammad وسلم, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Salman al-Farsi. On the enemy side, the commanders were Abu Sufyan and Amr ibn Abd al -Wud. The reason for starting the Battle of the Trench was to protect Medina from the attack that was led by Banu Qaynuqa and Banu Nalir, who were tribes that were in alliance with the Quraysh. They wanted to attack as an act of revenge after being expelled from Medina. A group of Jews together with a number of the Banu Wa'il tribe went to the Quraysh tribe and told them that they have the full support of the Jews to attack Medina and to start a war against the Prophet Muhammad When Muhammad heard about the news that the Jews are against the Muslims, 
He called his companions and started taking suggestions from them. Salman al-Farsi was the one who told Muhammad wasallam to start digging a trench around Medina. It took the Muslims six whole days of hard work to dig it. Muhammad wasallam divided the Muslims into groups of ten and dug the trench alongside Medina. Due to this digging of the trench by the Muslims, the Muslims who were fewer in number were able to defeat the enemy forces. The victory of this war had already been predicted by the Prophet ﷺ while he was digging the trench. He said, This is the Quraysh's last attempt to destroy Islam and Muslims, and from now on we will rule over them. The Muslims won this battle very easily, although the Muslims were just 3,000 men and the enemy forces were 10,000. Yet Muslims only suffered 1 to 5 casualties, while the enemies ended up losing 80% of their army. Muhammad ﷺ prayed and asked Allah to destroy the enemy for good, and Allah sent down a wind, possibly a storm, that took away everything that belonged to the enemy forces. After that, the Muslims conquered Banu Quraidha neighborhoods and ruled over these tribes proudly as more Muslims from these tribes accepted Islam and later Islam flourished in this region. The Prophet ﷺ dreamt that he and his followers were entering Mecca and performing tawaf, so he planned to visit Mecca and declared to perform Umrah. Prophet Muhammad took 1,400 Muslims and 70 camels with them to sacrifice. When the Quraysh's leaders came to know that the Prophet along with a large population of Muslim were coming to Mecca, they decided not to allow them to enter the city. So they sent Khalid bin Walid along with 200 fighters to stop them from entering the city. Muhammad وسلم, with his followers decided to change the route to avoid any war, so they came to a lesser known place called Hudaybiya. When they came to know that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, along with the followers were camping in Hudaybiya, they decided not to allow them to enter Mecca, so they sent Urwa bin Masood to negotiate with the Prophet. وسلم. When the Quraysh's representative saw the Muslim group have only swords that were in cases and animals to sacrifice, he came to know that Muhammad وسلم, only came for worship. He told the Quraysh's leaders to let them come into the holy city of Mecca because they were only here for worship. But the Quraysh leaders still wanted to prevent the Muslims from entering. Finally, Muhammad وسلم, sent Uthman bin Affan anhu, who had relatives and contacts in Mecca, but rumors of his death came out. So Muhammad وسلم, decided a war, although they had no proper equipment or arms to fight. Muhammad وسلم, quickly took an oath on his pious hand, and the news of the war spread in Mecca quickly. The Quraysh leaders panicked and released Uthman and sent Suhail bin Amru to negotiate the terms with the Prophet ﷺ. In the end, they reached the following terms. In the name of Almighty Allah, these are the conditions of peace between Muhammad ﷺ, the son of Abdullah, and Suhail bin Amr. Number 1. There will be no fighting between the Quraysh and the Muslims for the next 10 years. Number two, the Muslims would return to Medina that year, but they would be allowed to enter Mecca next year for pilgrimage, and they would only be allowed to stay in Mecca for three days. Number three, if a Quraysh from Mecca became Muslim and tried to enter Medina, he would be asked to return back to Mecca, and if a Muslim from Medina went to Mecca, he would not be accepted but the Quraysh would be free to receive any Muslim wishing to change his religion. Number three, the Muslims in the Quraysh would be free to sign alliance treaties with any tribes around Arabia. Apparently, the terms of the treaty were against the Muslims' wishes. They were sent back to Medina without visiting Mecca, and this made them shattered as Mecca was their homeland. But Muhammad ﷺ, along with his followers, showed extreme patience 
and gradually the treaty turned out to be a great victory for the Muslims. As per the agreement of Hudaybiyah, Banu Bakr tribe joined the Quraysh and Banu Khuza'a entered into alliance with the Prophet ﷺ. They both had a history of enmity for years between them. So just after 20 months, Banu Bakr attacked Banu Khaza'a and killed many people. The Quraysh helped them with armed forces and men. After this incident, the Quraysh sent a delegation to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ petitioning to maintain the treaty with the Muslims and offering material compensation. But Muslims refused this offer. The Muslim forces had gathered in strength to settle account with the Quraysh and for the final attack and the opening of Mecca. Muhammad ﷺ made a secret plan to surround Mecca with large forces so that the Meccans could surrender without a fight and without the bloodshed in the holy city of Mecca. In this 20 months, many tribes came into the fold of Islam, so Muslims came in thousands. The Muslims marched towards Mecca and camped at Mar al-Zahran and surrounded the city on the 7th of Ramadan. The Quraysh got perplexed with this sudden attack and the Muslims also sealed all the routes of escape. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ declared a general amnesty and the whole city was surrendered to him on the 10th of Ramadan without any fight. While they camped outside of Mecca, Muhammad ﷺ asked them to spread out the lights with fire at each camp. The 10,000 fires became visible to Mecca. Abu Sufyan, the Quraysh's leader and the bitter enemy of Islam, saw that scene and he was so moved that he sought the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and recited the kalma. After that, Muhammad ﷺ declared that whoever entered Abu Sufyan's home would be safe. Muhammad ﷺ gave strict orders not to start a fight and announced, This is the day of mercy. Then he entered the Kaaba touched the Hijr al-Aswad and recited Allahu Akbar, which his followers repeated, and the whole city was filled with that sound. Muhammad sallallahu made seven rounds around the Kaaba, then returned 360 idols that surrounded the mosque. He pointed at each idol, knocked each down, and recited, The truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Surely the falsehood is bound to vanish. The people of Mecca, holding their breath, were thinking of all the cruelty, injustice, and fights with his friends and his companions. Now it was in Muhammad ﷺ's control, he could take revenge. But he asked the people of the Quraysh, What are you thinking of me? And they said, We are not thinking of anything about you except kindness and good. Muhammad ﷺ said, I will say the same words, which my brother Yusuf said to his unkind brothers. Have no fear this day. May Allah forgive you and he is the most merciful of merciful. So Muhammad sallallahu granted general forgiveness. He said, I forgive all of you and make you free and clear that you may go after the pursuit of your life. Then Bilal radiallahu anhu called the Adhan and read Luhr prayer. After his return to Medina from the farewell pilgrimage or Hajj, Muhammad Wasallam's health began to decline. He delivered his last sermon at the Mount of Arafah on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah. Upon his return to Medina to his wife's home, he fell ill for several days and suffered with a fever and headache. During this time, Muhammad Wasallam's headaches intensified from time to time as well as a high fever. He went to lead prayers in the masjid with the help of his companions, and after the prayers, he said, Someone has been allowed to choose this world or his Lord. He chose his Lord. Abu Bakr anhu immediately understood he was referring to himself. He started crying. Muhammad wasallam consoled him and told him that he was very pleased with him. Later, he instructed those who had a right over him to come to him and ask for the rights. He had seven dinars in his possession that he decided to distribute to the needy people. His last words to his daughter and his aunt Sufia was, 
Perform acts of goodness valuable in the eyes of Allah, otherwise I cannot save you from his holding. He spent his last days with Aisha radiallahu anha three days before his death. He asked Abu Bakr to lead the prayers. One day he felt better and went to the masjid with the help of Ali radiallahu anhu and Fadl ibn Abbas when Abu Bakr was leading the prayer. He retreated to allow the Prophet sallallahu to return to his place, but Muhammad sallallahu asked him to continue and stood beside him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu visited him and upon seeing the situation slightly improved, he returned to his home. Muhammad sallallahu condition declined suddenly. According to Aisha's account, Prophet sallallahu passed in her arms and he said softly, There is no God but Allah. How difficult it is to surrender the soul and passed away in her arms with these words. The Prophet Sallallahu death caused great sorrow for Muslims. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu on receiving the news of the situation came directly to the Prophet Sallallahu side, raised the veil covering on his face, kissed him and said, O oh God's Messenger, you were beautiful while alive and you are beautiful in your death. Then he went to the masjid and declared his death and said, People, if any among you worship Muhammad وسلم, then let them know that Muhammad is dead. But whoever worships God, God is alive and will never die. When Umar anhu came to know about the Prophet وسلم's death, he got so furious and said, Whoever would say the Prophet ﷺ is no more, then he would cut his head with his sword. Usama ibn Zayd, Ali radiallahu anhu, along with the sons of the Prophet ﷺ's uncle, Abbas, Fadl, and Qusam, washed his body and placed his body in the grave in the Masjid and Nabawi. The funeral prayer was performed individually. First, the group of men, then the women, and then children came in the room where the Prophet Wasallam's body lied down. He died at the age of 63 and was buried in Masjid and Nabawi. Let's take a break and listen to a nasheed. Do you all know Mountains of Mecca? Feel free to sing along. O oh, mountains of Mecca, how was the dawn on the day that my prophet Muhammad was born? How did it feel knowing he was to be the last and most beloved of all? Rasul of Allah, Nabi of Allah. O oh, mountains of Mecca, you were there When the Prophet Muhammad climbed down in despair Engraved in his heart were the words of his Lord To all of mankind this was his call La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah O oh, people praise only Allah Glorify Allah O oh, mountains of Mecca, how did you mourn On the day that the Beloved returned to his Lord And up till the last breath escaped from his lips He prayed that his Ummah would find success O oh, mountains of Mecca, how will it feel When the earth shall quake and tremble with fear And we shall be gathered together to stand In the court of Allah with our deeds at hand Oh, how we pray that on that day We'll be with those to whom Allah will say Peace be with you I am pleased with you O oh, mountains of Mecca, bear witness that I To the oneness of Allah do I testify For all that He's given me, how can I deny My purpose in life should be only to cry La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah There is no God but Allah, Muhammad is His messenger 
Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Rasulullah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Nabi Allah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Rasulullah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Rasulullah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad Nabi of Allah. Great job with today's lesson, everyone. Now let's review with a very short quiz. Number one. The fourth group which was threatening the Muslims after the Battle of Badr among the Jews, the Quraysh, and the Bedouins was A. The hypocrites B. The Christians or C. The polytheists It's A. The hypocrites Number 2 during the summer, which country would the Quraysh travel to for trading? A. Egypt B. Abyssinia or C. Syria It's C. Syria Number 3. During the Battle of Uhud, 1,000 Muslim men faced blank kuffar. How many? A. 2,000, B, 3,000, or C, 4,000. The correct answer is D, 3,000. Number 4. Why did the archers leave their post during the Battle of Uhud? Was it A, because the Prophet ﷺ asked them to, B, because they thought they won the battle, or C, because they were scared of the enemies. The right answer is B, because they thought they won the battle. Number five, the Muslims' reaction to the torture by their enemies was to be A, angry, B, rebellious, or C, patient. Hope you got this right. It's C. Patient. Number 6. The Battle of the Trench is also known as A. Ghazwati Uhud, B. Ghazwati Khandaq, or C. Ghazwati Badr. The answer is B. Ghazwati Khandaq. Number 7. In the Battle of the Trench, Muslim forces were how many men? A. 3,000 B. 3,500 or C. 3,800 The right answer is A. 3,000 Number 8. According to the Hudaybiyah Treaty, the condition for no fighting between the two parties, as in the Muslims and the Quraysh, was decided for how many years? A. 8 years B. 9 years or C. 10 years The answer is C. 10 years Number 9 Muhammad Sallallahu last sermon on the Mount of Arafat was on what date? A. The 8th of Dhul Hijjah B. The 9th of Dhul Hijjah or C. The 10th of Dhul Hijjah The answer is B. 9th of Dhul Hijjah Last question Muhammad sallallahu died at the age of 53 and was buried in Masjid al-Nabawi.
Is this true or false? It's false. He died at the age of 63, but he was buried in Masjid al Nabawi. It's time for Sunnah of the Week. Today we'll talk about Muhammad Wasallam's favorite foods. Here are a list of foods that our Prophet Wasallam liked and are beneficial for us. Number 1. Honey. Aisha radiallahu anha narrated, Allah's Messenger وسلم, used to love sweet edible things and honey. Sa'id al-Qudri also narrates, A man came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, My brother has some abdominal trouble. The Prophet وسلم, said to him, Let him drink honey. The man came for the second time, and the Prophet وسلم, said to him, Let him drink honey. He came for the third time, and the Prophet وسلم, said, Let him drink honey. He returned again and said, I have done that. The Prophet وسلم, then said, Allah has said the truth, but your brother's abdomen has told a lie. Let him drink honey. So he made him drink honey, and he was cured. It is a very good idea for us to drink honey mixed in water. Number 2. Olive Oil Abu Usaid says, Rasulullah said, Use olive oil in eating and for rubbing on the body, for it is from a Mubarak, meaning blessed tree. Did you know that olive oil is also a great natural treatment for skin and hair problems? Number 3. Dates Narrated Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, I heard Allah's Messenger وسلم, saying, Whoever takes seven adwa dates in the morning will not be affected by magic or poison on that day. There is another hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Busr ibn Atiyah ibn Busr. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, came to visit us and we offered him butter and dates, for he liked butter and dates. So we can see that the Prophet وسلم, liked dates. Number 4. Barley if you don't know what barley is, it's a type of grain as you can see in this picture. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu reported that Rasulullah and his family spent many consecutive nights without food because there would be no supper. The bread of Rasulullah was mostly made of barley. In another hadith narrated by Umm Munthir bin Qais and Sariya, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, entered upon us, and with him was Ali bin Abu Talib, who had recently recovered from an illness. We had bunches of unripe dates hanging up, and the Prophet وسلم, was eating from them. Ali reached out to eat some, and the Prophet وسلم, said to Ali, Stop, O Ali, you have just recovered from an illness. I made some greens and barley for the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet وسلم, said to Ali, O oh, Ali, eat some of this, for it is better for you. So we can see that the Prophet وسلم, suggested eating foods with barley when someone is recovering from sickness. And to help us, we can make barley soup when we are sick. Now I want to ask you, how have you all been doing? I know this might be a difficult time for many of you, but it seems like going out safely is taking a little more time than expected. So how have you been spending your time? Are you running out of things to do? Our friends Aunt Asma, Leila, and Maryam had a very fun call recently. Aunt Asma talked about the different things you could do while staying at home during the quarantine. Let's take a look at their call. Assalamu alaikum, dear Layla and Maryam. How are you, my little angels? Wa alaikum assalam. We are good, alhamdulillah. How are you, Aunt Asma? I'm good, having fun. Really? You're having fun? We're so bored. Bored? Why bored? There's nothing fun to do right now, just online school and being stuck at home. It's so boring. We can't go out with friends and we don't have anything to do at home. 
I'm actually enjoying this a lot. How? Don't you get bored? No, my kids. I see this as an opportunity to do so many things. Like what? Well, since I'm not going out as much, I can do things that I've always wanted to do. When we get busy in our lives outside, we never actually get around to doing the things we need to get done. Since we are social distancing, I have the time to do so much at home. Tell us, what have you been doing? Let me give you an idea. A day can never get boring if you plan it properly. A plan? That sounds serious. Actually, I plan my day so that I make the best of it. There are a few things that make a day great. First, you have to make sure you spend your time wisely and divide it between a few things. Your work, your time for your spirituality, time with family, time for yourself, time for service, and time with your friends. There's so many things. Variety is the spice here. Divide the 24 hours you have every day into all of these categories and you'll never feel bored. How? First, make sure that you offer your salah on time and all other things will fall under the schedule. Grab a pen and write down the times of salah. Then you can write in some time to work on school. Once you're on summer vacation, try to learn something new from the people around you. You can try learning cooking, baking, knitting, photography, or anything else that they are good at. You can even look up some videos that can teach you a new skill that you're interested in. Knowing a skill can never hurt, you know, and it can be something fun to spend your time on or show to other people. What about the rest of the day? Try helping your family with stuff around the house. You can help your parents in the kitchen or with anything else they do throughout the day. If you're not sure what to help them with, just ask them how you can help. They are really, uh, they'll really appreciate it and you might have some fun with your family while you do it. You'll also get to see how things work around the house day to day. I know I can help dad clean up the storage area in the basement. He's been busy with that for the last few days. And I can help mom with that cake she's been planning to make tomorrow. Yes, now we are talking. Later in the day, you can decide a time with your family to sit and read one page from Quran with translation. Send salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and make a small dua as a family. It will only take 10 minutes, but it's so much fun to discuss Quran and make dua with someone. Your day will already feel blessed. Then you can talk to some of your friends over the phone or on the computer. Try talking about your day or share something new that you learned. You can draw, write, or read on alternate days if you have fun doing those. There can be a game night where you can di play different games with your family. What kind of games? I'm sure you know some games to play. Like board games? Oh, I know. We can make puzzles. There's so much fun when everyone works on them together. Great idea. You can also play some other games. What about this one? Everyone writes an object on a paper, put it in a bowl, mix it up, then have everyone pick one. Everyone closes their eyes and draws what was on the paper. Fold it up and hand it to the person next to you when you are done. It's always really funny to see how everyone did. Another game is I Spy. I used to play this with my friends at school. You can play something different too. Like what? You can try drawing a big game of snakes and ladders out on the porch or the yard. Then get some big dice with cardboard or styrofoam and play with everyone. Everyone can act as their own piece. It's a fun project to try and make with your family, and the result is always worth it. Remember kids, if you keep yourselves busy in happy fun and good learning, you'll get through these days like a breeze. You'll feel less bored and your family members will also feel at ease. And if you give ease to others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes everything easy for you. Thanks Aunt Asma, I'm so excited to play some of these games. Yes, thank you. I think we've both got a good plan on what we're going to do in quarantine now. We miss you, Aunt Asma. Hope to see you soon. Don't worry. I will see you guys on the weekend in the park. Stay safe and keep your distance. We will. Thank you. See you soon. Ma salama. Wasn't that so fun? Did you get some ideas from our lovely Aunt Asma on what you could do during the day? I sure did. 
We have a couple more ideas for some fun activities. If you're feeling artsy, you can make footprint tracks. What you have to do is get a piece of paper or canvas, put some paint on the bottom of your foot, and step on the paper or canvas to make a footprint. And then you can draw in your own truck wheels and truck accessories just to make it your own personalized truck. But be sure to ask your parents permission first because it can get a little messy. If you like making bubbles, here's a cool mixture for unpoppable bubbles. Mix 6 cups of water with 1 cup of corn syrup and 2 cups of dish soap. You can use a metal wire or an old metal clothes hanger and make yourself a bubble wand. Now go out in the backyard and have fun with those bubbles. If you need a short activity for when you take a short break between working, you can play a quick game of hangman with your parents or siblings or even tic-tac-toe. They're simple but very amusing games. I hope you'll all start planning your day and make good use of your time. Do you remember the game we played last week where you had to close your eyes and make drawings of a tree, a house, a flower, and a fan? One of our lovely classmates sent a picture of their drawing. Look how talented they are, mashallah. Jazakallah khair for sharing your work with us. Okay, now let's go over the homework for this week. This week, you'll have to do a little thinking and reflection for your homework. There are three questions that you have to answer. Number one, why do you think there was a need for the military activities after the Battle of Badr? Number two, did the Muslims win the Battle of Uhud as they won the Battle of Badr? And what went wrong during the Battle of Uhud? And number three, patience is a virtue of a believer. From your past experience, give an example of when your patients resolved a problem. I have some very exciting news for you. It's about our summer classes. Check out this flyer right here and show it to your parents too. I hope you all can join us. And that's it for today. Hope to see you in the summer. Assalamu alaikum.